Okay, Ecclesiastics chapter 4 through 6 this evening. Let me give you a quote from Benjamin Franklin. Who is rich? He that is content. Who is that? Nobody. Isn't that true? You know, as we go through these chapters, um, I have found, if you read ahead, I have found that I fall in a lot of these areas. You know, it really has ministered to me, my perspective in life. Obviously, Solomon uh, is not having a great perspective. His perspective is from the human perspective, uh, from the flesh. Uh, and that's why he loses hope. That's why he doesn't have faith. That's why he doesn't trust in God. And that's why everything is vanity. It's just a waste of time. Why do we even do it? And even in our riches, what's the purpose of it? I mean, why do we have riches? Uh, you can be rich and yet... It can be taken away just like that. And so what we do with it is very important. In fact, I want to say this, that if we sow sparingly, then we will reap sparingly. There's there's somebody just recently who has been looking forward. They've been looking forward to a settlement from an estate months. And so they had planned some things based upon what they felt they were going to get on this uh, nice settlement in a certain amount. And I know for a fact that the person does not not tithe because I I, I asked them (laughs) when they came to me afterwards and said, this isn't fair because the settlement went from this much to more or less than half of what they thought they were going to get. And so I asked, well, are you tithing? And now, I'm not God, I don't know the heart, and I don't know the plan of God, but God does tell us that we're to be good stewards of what He gives us, and when we're good stewards of that, He rewards us for that. Uh, Corinthians chapter 9 tells us that if we sow, that is, if we give sparingly, we'll reap sparingly. And so could it be that she reaped or sowed sparingly, and so what she thought she was going to get, God says, you know what, you're not getting that. Because you have sold sparingly, so I'm just going to give you sparingly. Now, who knows if she would have tithed on a regular basis if God would have given it to all to her or more. And what's interesting is, is that the way that this lawyer had, had distributed, it, it went not just to the siblings, but to the deceased siblings' family who weren't even paying the taxes on this property on this estate and it was just the siblings paying for it and so they got a free ride they got free money and i'm sure they're jumping up and down for it and they're all ungodly you know they're all ungodly so i I just wonder you know the scriptures are true if we sow sparingly then we're going to reap sparingly now malachi tells us in the old testament test god in fact if we're not tithing we rob god And he's talking to the priesthood uh, there in the temple, that the priests were robbing God because as priests, they were supposed to tithe. I'm supposed to tithe. And by the way, when I speak on this subject, I tithe. And you might be saying, well, do you tithe, Pastor? Yes, I do tithe. And, And I tithe on everything that I get. All the usable income that God gives me, I tithe on it because it's usable. And 10% of that goes to the Lord's work. And To be honest, I give it all to the church. It's rare that I give it outside the church unless the Lord really lays it on my heart. But my tithe goes to the church. Above that, I usually give outside the church. If I give to someone, it's an offering for that person. And so I give it to them. Uh, Sunday, someone asked if the church could give them some money. I hate putting the church in that type of burden. So I gave it to them. I didn't tell them that. Now I just lost my reward. But that's okay because I'm making a point here. Um, I gave it to them and said, don't worry about it. And they were just appreciative for the church, you know. So on top of the tithe and offerings, there are offerings that I give outside of the church, whether it's the various ministries that are out there, uh, a a certain political group or whatever it is. And so I am faithful to do that so that I can teach on it and tell you that I do it and it works because I know that it works. I know it's difficult and it's hard to do in the very beginning because it is your money. We work hard for our money, don't we? We put, we put 40 hours in a week, some of us a lot more than that. And, and when you make more, I mean, obviously there's a tenth more that comes out. And so it's hard to depart from that one-tenth. 
but yet you'll go to a restaurant. My wife's good at this. We'll go to a restaurant and she'll tell me, leave 20 percent. And I'm like, 20 percent? They don't deserve 20 percent. You know, I'll leave 10 percent. Usually that's the standard, right? Well, it used to be. 20 or 10 percent and then it kind of creeped up to 15 percent and now it's 20 percent i think 20 percent is too much and 15 percent is too much if you if you're not willing to give god 10 percent you better not give some man 10 percent uh, tip on their service for you when god serves us far greater far greater than anybody that serves our food to us and we even tip people that are in fast food places they're now putting their little tip cans right there right in and out, and there's a tip can there. Why? So they take your order. Thank you for taking my order. Here's a tip. You know? And so we need to, we need to think about this. Because as believers in Christ Jesus, being you creatures in Christ, this is an aspect of our life that God wants us to work on. Because being a good steward is important to Him. A steward at that time was a person that ran a household. Usually you would hire a student to, to run your household. They would run your vineyard, they'd run your children, they'd run your finances, they'd pay your bills. They would do all those things. They were good stewards over what you owned. You hired them to do that. We call them accountants today. Administrators and so forth for our own household. Now, we pay them to do that job. And so they better do a good job because it's our money and we're trusting them with our money We're trusting them with our bills and our finances and taxes and all those things. Well, that is a spiritual example for us because God entrusts us with all of the resources that he's given to us. And he wants us to be good stewards of those resources, whether it's money, whether it's vehicles, houses, whatever material things that we have, we are to be good stewards of it. And good stewards is not necessarily just just paying your tithe to the Lord, but taking care of what He has given you. Taking care of your car. You know, on a regular basis, change the oil. Make sure it's running good so that it lasts longer and you're not buying a car every four years when they want you to, they expect you to. But, you know, you're taking a little bit longer. We try to buy a car every 15 years, if not even more than that. The van that we own is over 14 years now. No, actually, it's 15 years coming this, this coming year. 15 years, and it's still running, so we're not buying a car. And so it's not just money, but it's even what we own. Even the clothing that we have, even the clothing that we wear, being good stewards of what we buy, when we need those things. Now, I know we splurge. We all splurge. I know I just splurge. I bought me a new pair of tennis shoes. I I just liked them, and, and I just wanted them, and so I went ahead and, and bought them. You know, But we need to think about this idea of stewardship that is taught in scriptures. Now, Solomon is looking at, at it from a perspective of human. That's human where he sees that even the rich and all that they have and, and what they can enjoy and so forth, and yet they don't fully enjoy it. And he's going to talk about that as we go through this. So let's, let's go through this. I, I challenge you. I apologize if I offended you. I know that you feel like it's your money, but it, it's not. It's God's money. He's very clear in his word that we're to be good stewards of that money. And we are to use it for his glory. In fact, Paul talks about it in Timothy that those of you that are rich and have enough money, that you shouldn't be using it on yourselves because eventually it's going to go away. And we'll see that in a minute. You need to use it for God's glory and for His kingdom. That's where it needs to be used. Because you're sending things to heaven ahead of you. And so, let's look at chapter 4 as he starts with that vanity, that emptiness of oppression. He says in verse 1, Then I returned and considered all the oppression that is done under the sun. So you think about all the oppression. Whether they're poor, middle class, whether they're in the eastern countries, you know, and they're impoverished, whatever type of oppression is, whether it's a husband oppressing a woman or a woman oppressing her husband, you know, anything that oppresses. He, he, he looked at this, he considered, he meditated upon it, he thought about it all day long. He's a billionaire, all he can do is sit around and just think about these things, Solomon. He says, and look, the tears of the oppressed, but they have no comforter on the side of their oppressors. There is power, but they have no comforter. It's something he knew, something he saw, that those that were oppressed really had no power. They had no comforter. In fact, it's the philosophy of, uh, of survival of the fittest, right? Survival of the fittest. The might will overcome the weak. You know, and if you're weak, get out of the way because we'll push you out of the way. 
And that's the philosophy. And he saw that, that in men, in society, and those around him, that it was always the might, it was always the strong, it was always those that were superior that were pushing everyone else that were weaker out of the way. And he saw that they had no comforter. Of course, we know that our comforter is who? Jesus Christ. Uh, we may be weak, we may be poor, we may be oppressed, but we find comfort in the Holy Spirit of God. So he says, therefore, I praise the dead who were already dead, more than the living who are still alive. Yet better than both is he who has never existed, who has not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Imagine the oppression, Hitler, you know, Stalin and those type of things. And Solomon says, you know what? I think about the dead. They're blessed. They don't have to go through the oppression. In fact, those that don't even ever existed, whoever they are, they don't exist. They don't have to go through life, you know. It's almost like, I don't want to bring a kid into the world because you're going to suffer so much. So why bring him into this world? And see, he's lost hope. He doesn't see God in the picture. He doesn't see the work of God, the plan of God. And so he has this view. It's a wrong type of view to have. But he thought, look, observing the oppression that's going on, no comforter. Hey, it's better to be dead than to go through all of that oppression. How many of you, when you go through struggles, one of the first things you ask is, God, would you remove this from me? How many of us ask that almost immediately? God, just take it away. That is usually the natural thing we want to happen. Just take it away, God. We don't want to deal with this. You know what we need to do is change our mindset and say, Lord, would you teach us through this? Will you teach me something through this? Will you help me to grow stronger through this situation? To grow in my relationship with you, my faith, my trust. Whatever it is that you're trying to teach me, help me to learn it, Lord. Instead of just trying to get out of it or get through it. Learn something. So basically he's saying it's better, you're better off dead than to suffer oppression. Now the vanity of labor. Again, I saw that for all toil and every skillful work, a man is... It is envied by his neighbor. Uh, so in other words, uh, there are men who work. They work hard. Or they get things. And yet his neighbor sits around all day and looks at him and says, Boy, I wish I had a job like that. But they really don't want to work. They just envy other people that work. He says, This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. The fool, the fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. And what a waste for those that just sit around like, I wish I had a job. And then when they get a job, they can't even keep the job. You know, because they're too lazy to work hard in that job. You know, so, so they sit around and eventually they just waste away themselves. And they're really hurting themselves more than anyone else. I know in our society today we, we have this idea that uh, people owe us something. You, you get that idea? Government owes us something. People owes us something. And so they feel like, I don't have to work. You need to pay me. I'll just go on welfare or I'll just go unemployment or I'll just do that. Now, unemployment is different. It's there. You pay into it. And there's a certain amount that you pay into it. And so you have a right to get that when you're out of work. I don't think you have a right to misuse it, but you have a right to use it. But there are those who just, you know, give me a handout. Give me a handout. You know, and it's always about what someone else should give them because they have a right. I remember years ago there was a certain person that uh, was saying, my parents need to pay for my education because I didn't ask to be born. You know, they brought me into this world, and so they should pay for it. You know, and that's the attitude that we have today. And that's sad because eventually you can, you're just consuming yourself in your own flesh. You need to work hard. There's nothing wrong with working hard. There's nothing wrong with taking pride in serving the Lord. I, I know that... The system is corrupt. I know corporate America. I know your boss. I know it's hard at times because they want to make money and greed and so forth. But you have a responsibility as a believer beyond what the world does. We're a light. We're a salt. We're to work hard. We're to let them know that we serve someone greater than them. And when they ask us, why do you work so hard in light of all that's going on? Because we know the Lord and because we love him and we work for him. Yeah, no, you work for me. No, I work for him. It just happens that you hired me and I'm working for him. So you're going to get 100% from me. You know? And I think they'll appreciate it. And they'll reward you for that when you do that. The fool folds his hand and consumes his own flesh. Better a handful with quietness than both hands full together with toil and grasping for the wind. And then the vanity of being alone. Verse 7. Then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. 
So you get this picture, and you get this picture of this billionaire, you know, and I return, and I sat under a tree, and I just, there's the sun. Everything's vanity under the sun. And he's got this real negative attitude. And there is one alone without a companion. He has neither son nor brother, yet there is no end to all his labor, nor his eyes satisfied with riches. He has everything he could ever want. Now, it could be he's talking about himself. Here I've got everything that I, I need, but yet I have no son. I have no relationship. I have no brother. I'm alone all by myself, all this wealth, and, and I can't spend it on no one. You know, it's just, I'm just making it and making it, and it's getting stored and stored and stored, and here I am all by myself. But he never asked, for whom do I toil in to prave myself of good? This also is vanity and a grave misfortune. Here I work, I work, I work, and I work. There's no brother, there's no son. Who's going to get my, who's going to get my rewards? Who's going to get my money? Who's going to be left with it when I die? Here I'm working hard all day long, and boom. So he's like, so why work? It's all vanity. Someone else will enjoy it. You know? I, I had that philosophy. I, working for Southern California, I was just talking to someone about this. I was working for Southern California Edison, and I wanted to get in the ministry full time, and we were praying about it, just waiting on the Lord's timing. So I paid everything off. So I was working, I was working easily 15 to 17 hours a day. On Wednesdays, I'd work all the way up until 6, and then I'd drive straight here, teach. You know, sometimes I'd even go back to work and work through the night, but it was with a purpose to pay everything off. And I'll tell you what, that's a lot of work. It gets tiresome after years and years of doing that. It just seems like you're always working, always working, and what are you working for? To build your house, to build your barns? To build your silos, you know, and, and then all of a sudden you retire. With Edison at the time, when, when people were retiring, they were expected to live four years after they retired. Someone would die two, three years after because they didn't know what to do after retirement. And so here they worked all their life for all this wealth, and then they die. And then their spouse dies, and then their kids all get it. And what do they do with it? They don't appreciate it as much as... They who, who worked for it appreciated it. And I used to think, I'm going to leave my house to my kids. That was our plan. My retirement is there, but I don't plan on retirement. It all goes to my kids. And we had set up a living trust the whole bit. And then the Lord's kind of been telling me, no, it's there to provide for you now. I'll take care of them then. Now, if it's there at the end and I die, they get it. But if not, then too bad. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they need to they need to work and they need to you know, store up their own little nest for the future if something happens. I thank God that I was wise enough to do that because it's been helping us in these latter days of our, our life. That's wisdom. But where would it all go? If we were to keep it, it would go to them. And would they appreciate it? I don't know. Only God knows that. And so it's vanity that you work so hard and then, and then you don't even get to enjoy it. Take time to enjoy it. So when I quit quit Southern California Edison. I work more here at the church, but I tell you what, I enjoy it 110% more. I love being here. I need to be here as often as I can because it's not stressful for me. Even through the struggles and stuff, it's, it's church, but you know what? I know who I'm serving, you know, and I serve him and him alone. And that brings so much joy and so much peace in my life because he knows my heart. And so I do it unto him and for his glory. Now, he says in verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward in their labor. Isn't that true? That's so true. One working in a household can make ends meet, but two working, boy, you get twice as much. So you can buy some things. In fact, it, it was probably back in during what, World War I or two that all the men went to war and all the women began to work to take care of their households. Even the children began to work. And when they saw that and all the men came back, guess what? The lady said, wow, this is nice. Now you're working and I'm working because I have a job already. And we've got twice. We can actually buy a house. We can actually buy a car or two cars. We can get furniture. We can get all the toys and boats and things like this. So let's do it. And that's where the two family households began to, to work in our society. And they didn't want to give that up because it was too much materialism. But it is true that two can work and it is a little bit better so marriage is good in a way, isn't it? 
it's a lot easier when two are working instead of one working. And of course, not necessarily just marriage, but in a ministry. I found in ministry, it's a lot harder when I am doing everything. And I thank God that God raises up men who actually want to lead and want to prepare and set things up, whether they're you know, events or so forth, where I don't even have to get involved. So in that case, one, two, three, four are better than one. When you have others involved in that labor, you get twice, three times as much done. I couldn't have done the Thanksgiving. I couldn't have done the, the um, Harvest Carnival. There's no way. And yet God has raised up people to do that. And I'm hoping he continues to raise up people to do that. Uh, we need people to help in those areas that have the initiative to know how to lead and to know how to prepare and plan and cover all the bases. That takes a gift. Now, I'm not saying that person is special above anyone else. That's not what I'm saying. They're gifted in that area. There are others that are gifted in serving and they know how to serve and they're here and they're faithful. And we have a lot of those in this church, too. And so I'm really blessed to have other labors besides myself that are working together because we get twice as much, three times, four times as much done. And verse 10 says, if, For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to lift him up or to help him. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. That's true too. Two are better than one. It's a lot harder being alone. You can fight against those who overpower you. Uh, you can be warmed. Those of you that are single, remember that? I don't remember it. I got married too young. I got married at 18. And so I don't remember being single. I don't remember laying in my own bed. Some of you that, you know, unfortunately have been separated or divorced or went through whatever, you know. Um, God is good. But now you know that two are better than one. I'm sure you do because it's harder being alone after you've been married, sharing a bed with somebody. You know, let me just say this, too. You don't want to go back to that. If you have a marriage and it's struggling or you're having struggles in that marriage, Appreciate it because you, you would have more struggles being alone. It would be harder for you to make ends meet. It would be harder for you to stay warm in your bed unless you go out and sin. But I'm talking about a godly man, a godly woman. It is easier to have two. And when you include God, then a threefold cord is not quickly broken. You include God in there. And you allow His Word to be your guiding light, both husband and and both wives, hear me, what I'm saying here. When you allow the Word of God to be your guiding light, both of you, men and female, you won't be broken. You're, you're that threefold cord, not just two, but three together. And you're stronger together. But you both have to submit to the will of God and to His Word. And that's the struggle. Or you can go back to being alone and lay in a bed cold. And we have a king-sized bed. So Virginia is way at one end, I'm way at the other. And it gets cold at night. And so what I do is I usually scoot over. And I notice she scoots over. And all of a sudden, like, oh, okay, we're warm again. And we just go right back to sleep. And then it's like, oh, scratch my back. Yeah, right there. I, I could not live alone. I could not live alone. Uh, I know you'll get mad at me. But if the Lord takes her, I will get married ASAP. As soon as I can. Because I will not survive alone. I apologize, but that's just the way it is. I cannot be alone. I've never been alone. My mommy took care of me. I turned 18. Virginia took care of me. And she's going to take care of me until I die. And if she dies, then Bertha's going to take care of me, whoever it is, you know, <laughs> because it's harder to live alone. Even though it's hard living together in two personalities, it's harder to live alone. I'm sorry. I just can't do that. And so that to me, really speaks loud. Then he, he mentions some, some parables here in the finish up this chapter. Better a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who will be admonished no more. I think he's speaking of himself. How wise he was when he was young. How foolish he's become as a king. And yet no one can admonish him because he's the king. 
Sometimes that happens in age. That ministered to me. You know, we, we have to be teachable. Even in our older age, there are things that we're still learning and, and hopefully continue to learn until the Lord takes us. For he who comes out of prison to be king, although he was born poor in his kingdom. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. I know Joseph was poor. And he was unjustly thrown into prison and he became the right hand man of Pharaoh himself. So not quite sure what he's saying there. I saw all the living who walk under the sun. So again, he's observing this. They were with the second youth who stands in his place. Could be he's talking about himself there. He was the second born. Remember, his brother died through Bathsheba. He was born the second. Could be that David didn't want him to really be the king he wanted his firstborn to be king which usually was the custom at that time couldn't happen so he could be that second there was no end of all the people over whom he was made king yet those who came afterwards will not rejoice in him surely this also is vanity and grasping for the wind in other words as a king and when he dies who's going to remember him life goes on right I mean, it's, it's like the next step. You know, I think of Pastor Chuck and how quickly life goes on. In fact, you start hearing people's pastors saying, Chuck would have wanted us to go on. Let's stop dwelling on his, uh, on his death and him leaving. And let, let's see what God now has ahead of us. He's already in heaven. Let's move on. And the next generation, we'll, we'll have a picture of him. And that's probably all we'll remember about him, you know, in generations to come because life goes on. Now, chapter 5. Walk prudently. Prudently means uh, in wisdom. When you go to the house of God. Oh, be careful how you come to the house of God. Prepare your hearts when you come here to worship. To focus on His Word. It's precious. And so, uh, when you come to make vows and promises and to serve and various things like this, be careful. And draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools or foolish vows is what he's talking about in the context. For they do not know that they do evil. And people do that. They, they make foolish vows. They make foolish promises. And they don't really realize that they're, they're, they're not righteous in, in not keeping them. They're actually evil because they've made these promises. Be careful what we say. Do not be rash with your mouth. And let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven and you're on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. God hears you. So don't make foolish vows and promises. You know, I'll serve you in the ministry, Lord. I'll be committed, Lord. I, I, this is my calling and I'm going to fulfill it, the Lord God. And then you don't. You know, I'll help in this area and then you don't show up. You know, I'm going to be committed here and then you don't do it. Lord, I promise I'm going to serve you and then you don't serve him. Be careful. It's, ra it's better not to promise anything and just let, let the Lord do his work in your life. But if you promise, you better keep it. God expects you to keep your vow. It's serious. He's serious about it. A man is known by his words and his word means something. You know, and we need to make sure that our words mean something when we keep our vows. These chairs got sold, and we thought we had seventy of them. So I thought, oh, let's, we'll probably get about three hundred and fifty dollars for them. And so uh, the person that bought them, <clears throat> you know, expecting three fifty. So I, I, I came here to church to count them, and they um, calculated. They calculated well, three fifty seventy comes out to five bucks a chair, right around there. So I said, yeah, go ahead, tell them five bucks a chair. When we got here, there's only fifty chairs, so it's now two fifty. So, so um, I was like, oh boy, uh, uh, I told them five dollars, you know, and it's only two fifty because we only have fifty, you know. Maybe we should tell them eight. And I go, no, I already told them five dollars. I'm not going to go back on my word, you know. If if we lost, we lost. That's okay, but our word is our word. So they got them for five dollars. So two fifty, that's fine. The Lord will take care of us. So we need to keep our word. Verse three: For a dream comes through much activity. Um. It's hard work trying to fulfill your dreams, right? We all have dreams. We all had dreams. And it's hard to fulfill those dreams. And a fool's voice is known by his many words. Be careful that you're not a fool speaking a lot. It's better to be quiet than always talking. This and that and this and this and this and, you know, whatever. And dreams and various things. And then you become made a fool because you can't complete. 
you know, those dreams and so forth. When Virginia and I bought the house, one of our dreams was to have a house with a big yard so we can have a garden and animals and so forth. We have the garden and it's gone. Now we've got the animals. And I can't wait for them to be gone. <laughs> that pig's getting fat. I smell bacon in the air. I mean... He was out again, and I can't, his stomach is just bloated. And all of a sudden, he's walking up, and he just falls on his side and just laying on. What's wrong, Wilbur? And he's full of red from pomegranates all over again. It's like, Wilbur, you're, just, you're hurting yourself. I'm just telling you, the more you eat, <laughs> you're just hurting yourself because you're going to be, be baking soon with pozole, pig's feet, or menudo, you know. <laughs> but we have the, the pigs now and the animals, you know. Our dreams, it's taken only 25 years. <laughs> it's hard work. And a, and a fool's voice is known by his many words. Uh, so if you speak, speak little. When, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better not to vow than a vow and not pay. Do not let your mouth cease your... Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin. Nor say before the messenger, or some of your writers may say angel of God, that it was an heir. The word angel in the Hebrew means messenger because he's a messenger bringing a message. Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hand? For in the multitude of dreams and many words there is also vanity. But fear God. It's vanity. It's vanity. It's vanity. Not to have dreams, because we need to have dreams and goals. The Bible is clear that we need to desire and have these dreams. But knowing that it's the Lord's will, if it's the Lord's will and it's his desire and he lays it on our hearts, then we pray that God will fulfill our dreams. But if not, we're content to trust in the Lord also. If you see the oppress, oppression of the poor and the violent Perversion of justice and righteousness in a province. Do not marvel at the matter. For high officials watch over high officials. And higher officials watch over them. <laughs> That's our government, isn't it? Well, who's watching those guys? I don't know. Oh, well, let's create a bunch of guys to watch those guys. Well, who's watching those guys? I don't know. Well, let's create another bureaucracy to watch over those guys. Well, who's watching those guys? I'm going to watch over those guys. I'm the President of the United States and I can just write an executive order. You know, and that's the way it is. But don't fret about it. It's just the way life is. And it's vanity. It's all going to perish is what he's saying here. Moreover, the, the profit of the land is for all. Even the king is served from the field. So his perspective is whether you're poor or whether you're rich, the land serves all, right? It serves all. Uh, just because you have money. You know, you don't get certain privileges from the land, but even the poor get privileges from the land. So it's for all. God's created it that way. He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This also is vanity. Now, here we go. If you love, and of course we know in the New Testament, the love of money is the root of all evil. If we love silver, guess what? You'll never be satisfied with it. It'll never increase. You'll want more and more and more and more. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. They increase who eat them. So what profit has the owner except to see them with their eyes? So here you have the land. You own the land. Your, your crops are in the land. And then all of a sudden you're eating a little bit of it. But you also see other people are eating your land. Your servants are eating your land. Your maid servants are eating of your land. The sleep of the laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much. But the abundance of, a rich, of the rich will not permit him to sleep. Isn't that the truth? Here, a poor man can work hard, come home, eat his food, and just relax with his family and enjoy the rest of the day. No worries, no cares, you know. No investments, no stock, no marketing, nothing. Rich man, he can work all day, make a lot of money. But then he comes home, he lays in bed, and goes, hey, I've got to sell that stock tomorrow. Oh, what if that happens? I better not do that. And he's thinking all night long about what he has and what he could lose. And so there's really no sleep for that man. Wealth isn't, isn't wrong in itself. I mean, strict, Scripture doesn't condemn wealth. There's nothing wrong with wealth. But we need to understand that wealth comes from the Lord. 
And if God gives you that wealth, there's a responsibility with that wealth. What it does condemn is the love of money. We should not love money. We should hold on to money very lightly. Not the money itself, but the love of money is the root of all evil. 1 Timothy 6.10 Man's attitude towards money is really the issue. It really is. And if you love money, well, how do I know if I love money? Well, like we spoke earlier, are you tithing? Are you tithing? If you're not tithing, you are in love with your money because you're not willing to give up what is God's. And so, yeah, I've got an issue here where in my stewardship, I'm not being a good steward and that I have this love for this money. I'm not willing to give it to the Lord. It's the Lord's already. So, yeah. And if you're using it only to, to consume on your own interests, your own desires, your own wants, you got another issue there, too, because it should be used for others, not just for yourself. Um, I'm just that, you know, God has just blessed me with with realizing that we need to bless others no matter what we do. Randy. <laughs> um, the Bible said it's more blessed to receive than to give, right? How come you, you guys No, more blessed to give than to receive. So when you have that attitude, then you're always looking for opportunities to give. Now, I know that, that people need to make money. But here, here, let me just give you an example. I go to the PT for this injury, and I've been there for eight months, and it hasn't helped. So I decide I'm going to go with this person that gave me the, the, the nutritionist diet. Within 12 weeks, exactly what he said, lost the weight and everything, just like on fire. He said, when you're ready, you come to me. I think they're overworking you, but I'll let you decide. So I finally said, this worked, I'm going to him. So I go, within two weeks, he tells me my leg is short, and it's because inflammation. He puts this machine on me, and I'm fine. It takes away all the inflammation, my leg is back to normal, I'm exercising now, and I'm feeling good. And today she, she had me jumping, and she's saying you should be able to run. And I'm thinking, what's the difference? One had me for eight months collecting money. Instead of looking into what is really the issue here. The other one is just saying, let's find the issue, let's fix the issue, and you'll be on your way. That's helping people. Where the other one is helping themselves through the money. Now, learning to be a giver and not a taker is looking for opportunities to give. Um, there's this acupuncture. Linda was telling me about a site. I said, I'm going to go try it. It may help me do it. 25 bucks. I can't beat that. That's a great deal. So I go down there and, and really nice people and they do the acupuncture and then they tell me, if you get somebody else here, we'll give you one session for free. So I post it on Facebook. You probably saw it, right? So, so 25 bucks. You can't beat the deal. If you're an ac a person that gets acupuncture, go for it. I'm not forcing anyone. I'm just letting them know. So then I go there today and, and I tell them, you know what? Why don't you create a, a Facebook page for the company and then you can put your little discounts there. You can talk a little bit about acupuncture, what it means, what it does. And she's like, wow, that is a great idea. Wow, thank you for sharing that. I'll go, yeah, no problem. You know, just being that type of person of saying, hey, I could help you because I see that there's a potential here, you know, and I could help you out instead of just keeping it, you know, keeping it to yourself or whatever. And people are like that. They like keeping stuff to themselves. I got a good thing here. Don't let anybody know. Because they're going to take it away from me, you know. But being a person that gives, gives, gives and looking for opportunities to, you know, to give. Not just money, ideas, you know, thoughts that can help them out. And they'll appreciate that. And they'll see like, that guy's a nice guy. He's a nice guy. Why would he do that? You know, and then they find out, you're a pastor. Oh, I'll pray for you, okay? I'm like, oh, thank you. Thank you. You know, and that's how it works. And God takes care of you. And so... The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's our attitude towards money. There's nothing wrong with making a profit in the system itself. But it's wrong when people are thinking only of themselves. See, the love of money makes people try to get rich or to make more money. And what happens is they become greedy, right? Greedy. And now you have a corporation that's really bonded together. And they're bonded together. Why? Not because they're family. Not because they have the same interests. Not because they want to help each other. Because of greed. And if this company succeed, I succeed. I make more money. If I can get them to make money, then I make more money. And it's all about greed. 
And we need to be careful that it's not about greed and not about ourselves. It's not what holds us together, right? It holds the mafia together, right? It's all about greed. It's about how much money they can make. And you're part of our family. But you cross us, you're dead. No one will ever find you. That type of thing. And so this greed can hold all kinds of organizations together. It's amazing. Enron. United Way. Years ago, you may not remember this, but years ago, the CEO all of a sudden was taking a lot of money uh, from the United Way. I stopped giving to them. So when you have these type of corporations, you're possibly looking at greed. And that's why I'd rather give to my church that I know is working and serving the Lord. And they will benefit from it more because we know what is, where it's going and what's coming from it. So. so it goes on about wealth. Verse 13. There is a severe evil which I have seen under the sun. Riches, keep, riches kept for their owner to his hurt. But those riches perish through misfortune. When he begot a son, there is nothing in his hand. You know, the story of the person who goes from rags to riches and then goes back to rags again. But nothing is left, you know, for his son to inherit. And as or as he comes or came from his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came. And he shall take nothing from his labor, which he may carry away. And we know that's true. Um, Job said that, you know, also. You know, that I came into the world with nothing and nothing I'll leave. There's a guy named Cecil Rhodes. I thought this was interesting. He spent many years in Africa reaping and uh, raping their resources for diamonds and gold and land and all kinds of stuff. And on his dying bed, he said this. He said this. I found much in Africa. Diamonds, gold, land are all mine. But now I must leave them all behind. Not a thing I've gained can be taken with me. I have not sought eternal treasures. Therefore, I actually have nothing at all. That's the thought. That's the thought. Consume it all yourself. Consume it on yourself. Well, wait, it's not for myself, though. It's for my wife and my kids. Consume it on yourself and them. And send nothing to heaven. And when you die and you get there, you've got nothing. That's where we need to invest because there is a heavenly investment and we make it into heaven and God keeps track of it. And when you get to heaven, you'll be rewarded for your good stewardship. And so like we have today, you know, our 403ks, our IRAs and, you know, our stock markets and various means that we may want to invest in or private investment. We have an eternal one and we need to invest and think about that because we're not going to live here eternally. We're not. I know you're 21 or 33 and you think, well, I got a long ways to go. Believe me, it comes by really fast. Next thing you know is you're 52. Like, where did those years go? Or 70. And you're like, wow, I'm ready to die. Take me home, Lord. Invest into the future. And this also is a severe evil. Uh, just exactly as he came, so shall he go. And what profit has he who has labored for the win? All his days he has He also eats in darkness and he has much sorrow and sickness and anger. He is what I have seen or here's what I've seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life, which God gives him for this is an inheritance. Yeah, if God gives it to you, enjoy it, be blessed by it. But if God doesn't give it to you, then he doesn't want you to strive for it, doesn't want you to have it. Invest in what he has given you. Invest in the eternal wealth that he's going to give you later on. Send it ahead, but be content with what he has given you here. As for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, this is a gift of God. For he will not dwell unduly on the days of his life because God keeps him busy with the joys of his heart. So when you focus on the Lord doing what he has called you to do, there's no worries. There's just peace and you're satisfied. That's why I love I love the ministry. I I don't mind it. It, You know, it's a joy to be here and to serve. And and the more that I'm getting better, the more I'm excited about what is is going on here. 
So, let's move on to the last chapter, verse chapter 6. It's a short chapter, so we'll get through it. The inability to enjoy wealth. Uh, he's going to conclude this idea on enjoying wealth and searching for satisfaction. He says, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is common among men. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor, so that he lacks nothing for himself of all he desires. Yet God does not give him power to eat of it, but a foreigner consumes it. This is vanity, and it is an evil of affliction. So again, the same thought here. He works all his life, and then he doesn't even get to enjoy it. Someone else comes along, a stranger, and enjoys it uh, instead of him. If a man begets a hundred children and lives many years, so that, the, so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with goodness, or indeed he has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better than he, for it comes in va- vanity and departs in darkness, and its name is covered with darkness. Though it has not seen the sun or known anything, this, is, this has more rest than that man. Even if he lives a thousand years twice, so two thousand years, but it has not seen goodness, do not all go to one place. Now he's speaking here of that person who has many children, and yet they don't care for him. There's no love for him. He works hard all of his life as a father. He supports them, sends them out to get educated, trains them, teaches them everything. And then as he gets older, they don't care about him. In fact, they're waiting for him to die so that they can just take his resources. How sad that is. How sad that is. We're almost done. God's given us families. You ever ask, why did he create families? Adam and Eve and families. Families are a reflection of Christ and the Trinity. We should be valuing our families. Our society devalues our families. They break down our families. If you're married, you cherish your relationships. I know it's hard, but you cherish, you work at it, you submit to the Word of God, and you let your marriage reflect Christ. And your children then should respect and love you and support you and honor you as parents. And as they get older, they need to continue to do so because you're family. And God's put you in that family for a reason. And it's sad when families break apart. It's sad when families don't work things out. It's sad that families don't talk to each other. And I know some of you probably have family like that. And you just don't talk to each other. You need to work through those things. You need to, especially if you're believers. You need to forgive. You need to forget. You need to move on. Because your family, your blood. And that's thicker than anything else. And you have to have that mindset. No matter what, through thick or thin. As a husband and wife, you made a covenant and a vow. Whether good or bad, whether rich or poor, you're committed to one another. I mean, me and Virginia, you know, don't have the greatest relationship. But one thing that we know is that we are stuck with each other till the day that we go home to be with the Lord. That's it. We're, we're it. There's no more. We're committed no matter what. We may not talk to each other for a while, but hey, we're still committed to one another and we'll work through that and God will have to get through my thick brain and, you know, through her her ways or whatever. And he does and he will. But you stick with each other. You don't separate. You don't alienate yourself from your family. That's not what you do. This is what Solomon saw in families. The children just back off and wait. See, that's what happened with this person. They get this estate and all these children and grandchildren are just going, enjoying life. And then all of a sudden, boom. Oh, here's this money. Oh, great. Instead of thinking, wait a minute, it's not ours. Because they know very well that this person gave it to his siblings and no one else. In fact, he left one sibling out. Well, guess what? They got theirs too. And they're not arguing about it. And they knew his will. They understood his will. But they're going to receive it because of greed. Because they don't care about family and the values that are in family. You know, and we need to really think about that in our own families. So let's uh, finish up here. All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the soul is not satisfied. For what more has the wise man than a fool? What does the poor man have who knows how to walk 
before the living. So there, there's just no satisfaction in feeding your flesh. You know, the more you eat, the more you want. The more you desire, the more desire you want. The more shoes you want, the more shoes you want after that. You know, it just doesn't stop. You're not satisfied. And we all go through those things, don't we? We go through phases where we, we get interested in something. And so now we're focused on that. You know, and we stay focused on that. And we've got to have not just one. We've got to have three. We've got to have five. And then we've got to go out and, and play with it. And we've got to do this until we get tired. And then we find something else. And we do that because we're never satisfied. Nothing will ever bring us satisfaction like the Lord. Nothing. He satisfies us completely, the Bible says. Your spouse will not satisfy you. They can't satisfy you. God did not create your spouse to satisfy you. He will satisfy you. If you're dissatisfied with your spouse, good. Go get your satisfaction from the Lord. Go seek him. Sit at his feet. Get deeply into his heart and be satisfied with him because your spouse will not satisfy you. It's impossible for them to satisfy you. And you shouldn't be looking for them to satisfy you. You have a relationship with them and your relationship should reflect your relationship with Christ. That's where your satisfaction is. Your satisfaction doesn't come in your wealth, in your job, in your church, in your service at church. It doesn't come from that. You will not be satisfied serving here. Already people are getting uh, weary of serving. Serving is hard because there's no reward for it down here. It's all up there. And it's hard to keep your mind on it up there and not down here. And so when people don't recognize you, you're not satisfied. You won't find satisfaction that way. You have to serve him. And you know that he sees you and you know that he's satisfied and you can be satisfied that he knows that you're doing it for his glory. Because we are not going to satisfy you. I can't satisfy you. Leadership can't satisfy you. And if you're looking for satisfaction in the church, in the body of Christ, a brother or sister, you won't find it. It's impossible. That's why we need Christ in our life. He is our total satisfaction. He sustains us, whether we're married or whether we're single. If you're single, he's your husband. He's your spouse. He's the one you have a relationship. And he satisfies you completely. Whatever one is, he has been named already. For it is known that he is man. And he cannot contend with him who is mightier than he. Since there, is, since there are many things that increase vanity, how is man the better? For who knows what is good for man in life? All the days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow. Who can tell a man what will happen after him under the sun? In other words, it's foolish to think that you know better than God. Because who knows what's good for man? Do you think you know what's good for you? You don't know what's good for you. Only God knows what's good for you. And that's why you can't find satisfaction in what you think satisfies you. Be satisfied with what God gives you. When you know that your maker has given you this, then be satisfied with it. If you're poor, be satisfied that you're poor. This is what God has made you. But serve him and send those rewards to heaven. Because you may be tithing. You may be using your wealth for his glory. You may be serving as a good steward. And that's going to heaven. And a rich man may not be. Who will be satisfied in heaven more? The poor man. So our contentment, our satisfaction comes in knowing that our king has given us what he thinks is good for us. Whether you're rich or whether you're poor, whether you're middle class. Whether you own a house or whether you don't own a house. Whether your car is a junker or whether it's a nice car. You know? It's all from the Lord and you need to be satisfied with it. Send it ahead because God knows what's best for us. If you want that abundant joy in your life, do the will of God and you will be satisfied.